Hello everyone, I am Shikha Laloria, Professor of Biochemistry at IASC. Welcome to this lecture which is the third in the series of my lectures on DNA replication. This lecture is mainly about eukaryotic DNA replication. But first I'd like to review what we know about DNA replication in general and also in the prokaryote, the E. coli bacterium. Uh, new DNA molecules are produced by copying of template DNA strands. Uh, you all know that DNA replication is semi-conservative. The newly synthesizing DNA chains grow in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction by addition of new nucleotides at the 3' prime end. An RNA primer is formed by a primase enzyme. RNA polymerase can initiate synthesis by joining two ribonucleotides, but DNA polymerase uh, can't do this. The enzyme DNA polymerase uses DNDPs and substrates and it adds a complementary nucleotide to the 3' hydroxyl of the deoxyribose of a primer paired with the template DNA strand forming a phosphodiester bond and uh, also releases a pyrophosphate in this process. Replication usually starts at an origin or initiator sequence and progresses bidirectionally. A replication bubble is formed at the site of initiation and the two oppositely oriented replication forks progress away from each other in E. coli, the replication origin of E. coli or E. C binds an initiator protein DNA A that causes melting of the AT rich region nearby. A DNA helicase enzyme DNA B unwinds the duplex DNA. A DNA primase associates with the helicase and an RNA primer is formed by the DNA primase enzyme. The DNA polymerase 3 holoenzyme synthesizes DNA by adding new nucleotides at the 3' prime end of the primer and DNA synthesis occurs in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. At the replication fork, the DNA pol 3 holoenzyme synthesizes DNA by adding new nucleotides at the 3' prime end of the primer. And due to the anti-parallel nature of the template strands, DNA synthesis on one strand is discontinuous. This is referred to as a lagging strand. And there are multiple priming steps and formation of Okazaki fragments on this strand. Replication on the other strand is continuous and it's referred to as the leading strand. Leading and lagging strands are synthesized simultaneously. Various proteins at the replication fork facilitate DNA replication, forming a complex yet coordinated replication machinery termed the replisome. Proteins important for replication include the initiator protein, the helicase, the single-stranded DNA binding proteins, primase, clamp loader and the tau protein, sliding clamps, and DNA pol 3 the clamp loader puts the sliding clamp around the primer template duplex at the primer template junction. The sliding clamp also binds to the DNA polymerase core subunit and holds it onto the DNA, enhancing its processivity. A loop is formed on the lagging strand between the DNA polymerase extending the primer and the helicase that binds the primase to initiate new primer formation. The size of this loop increases until the DNA polymerase reaches the end of the last Okazaki fragment and releases the DNA. Then a new loop is initiated and it also increases in size. And this cycle is continued till DNA synthesis is completed. And this is referred to as the trombone model of DNA replication on the lagging strand. In the end, there is enzymatic removal of the primer and this is followed by DNA synthesis to fill the gap 
and there is also ligation of the remaining neck by a DNA ligase. Shown here is the replisome at the replication fork and a somewhat improved version of the trombone model for coordinating replication at the lagging strand. So the steps are that there's an active helicase on the lagging strand template. Uh, the helicase is shown here. It moves in the five prime to three prime direction. Pol3 holoenzyme interacts with the helicase via the tau subunit. And this interaction actually stimulates the rate of strand separation by the helicase such that DNA unwinding occurs at the same rate as the rate of replication by the DNA polymerase. So if this association between the helicase and the DNA pol whole enzyme is not there, the unwinding slows down by about tenfold and the polymerase can replicate faster than the helicase can unwind and thus in such a situation the DNA polymerase can catch up with the helicase forming the replisome. The helicase enzyme extrudes a single-stranded DNA loop and uh, single-stranded DNA binding proteins bind to the single-stranded DNA to prevent the self-annealing. They are shown here in pink. Periodically, there is a primase which associates with the helicase and this synthesizes a primer on the lagging strand template. This interaction between the primase and the helicase is weak, but it actually stimulates the primase function by a thousand fold. The sliding clamp loader, uh, which is shown here, it recognizes this primer template junction and it assembles a sliding clamp onto uh, the primer, uh, which has been formed here. The unengaged second lagging strand DNA polymerase recognizes the loaded sliding clamp at the junction and then it goes ahead and synthesizes a new Okazaki fragment. So uh, now that's shown in this position, the Okazaki fragment has been synthesized and you can note that the lagging strand DNA is folded to bring this lagging strand polymerase into this complex with the leading strand polymerase molecule. And also, uh, it is also close to the three prime end of the completed Okazaki fragment and also close to the start of the next Okazaki fragment. Since the lagging strand polymerase is in the complex with other replication proteins, uh, in the form of the DNA polymerase holoenzyme, it can be reused to make uh, successive Okazaki fragments, alternating with the third polymerase core shown here as unengaged. Uh, the size of this loop which is formed between the helicase and the polymerase on the lagging strand changes in size. It initiates and it grows in size and then it's released. And then again a new one is formed that also grows in size. So hence the name of this model. Uh, as you may know, a trombone is a trumpet-like instrument having a sliding mechanism that varies the length of the air columns in the instrument to change the pitch repeatedly. So uh, the clamp was put at the primer template junction by the clamp loader. And uh, as mentioned, the clamp also binds and holds the Pol3 core enzyme on the lagging strand and uh, it holds it in place so uh, it doesn't float away if it falls off. So it uh, enhances its processivity in this way. The Pol3 core enzyme extends the chain at the end of the primer till it reaches the end and then it lets go. So the polymerase is released from the sliding clamp now, once it's completed. 
But before it lets go, meanwhile, another primer had been synthesized and uh, the other Pol 3 core, which was unengaged earlier, had started extending it. So uh, now this one becomes unengaged from the DNA strand and lets go. And then this process continues until the DNA replication is completed. In this animation by Drew Berry and Etsuko Uno, we can see these steps of DNA replication in quick succession, especially the repeated expansion of the loop on the lagging strand that resulted in naming of this mechanism as a trombone model. The helicase is shown in bright blue, unwinding the double-stranded DNA at the left side and the leading strand is synthesizing continuously and it can be seen uh, at the bottom whereas the lagging strand is shown at the top giving off the loop every time. The greyish green primase uh, arrives and it binds to the helicase and it forms the primer which is uh, denoted in yellow color there that's the primus and the primer the primer template junction is recognized by the clamp loader which is shown in lavender shade and uh, it loads a sliding clamp which is a green ring around the primer template junction the lagging strand pol 3 core enzyme uh, which is shown in purple, it binds and it initiates the synthesis of the Okazaki fragment. Now, uh, note that the loop increases in size with the progress of the lagging strand replication. When the polymerase reaches the end of the earlier fragment, it lets go and uh, then it becomes available to reinitiate at another primer template junction. The clamp uh, prevents the DNA polymerase from falling off and floating off uh, while it is uh, synthesizing the DNA and hence it enhances the processivity of the polymerase. In this model, you can see only two polymerase molecules are shown, not three. That is, there is only one for the lagging strand, not two as I explained, probably because this animation uh, was made at a time and it was not known that there are in fact three polymerase molecules in the DNA Pol3 holoenzyme. Now in this lecture, we will discuss DNA replication in eukaryotes and try to appreciate the similarities as well as the distinct aspects of replication in eukaryotes. This table shows the conservation of the replication machinery in eukaryotes and the enzymatic counterparts of the E. coli enzymes in the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae are listed here. So the helicase in budding yeast uh, is referred to as a CMG complex and it consists of CDC45, the MCM complex and GINS proteins. The primase is uh, referred to as DNA Pol alpha and uh, the SSP proteins are referred to as RPA or replication proteins A. Uh, the sliding clamp loader is referred to as RFC and uh, there are three kinds of them as we will see. Uh, the sliding clamp uh, is referred to as PCNA which stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen because this protein was found to be quite abundant in proliferating cells. The DNA polymerase, so uh, there are uh, in addition to Pol alpha which synthesizes the primer, there is uh, the Pol delta which synthesizes the lagging strand and Pol epsilon which synthesizes mainly the leading strand. Some of the other key differences are that eukaryotic cells of course already mentioned use three different DNA polymerases at the replication fork. The eukaryotic clamp loader is not bound to the DNA polymerase. The replication fork 
progression is much slower. It progresses at a rate of 20 to 60 base pairs per second as opposed to 1000 base pairs per second as we discussed in case of E. coli. The Okazaki fragment length also differs. It's a 1000 to 2000 nucleotides in prokaryotes, whereas it is 100 to 400 base pairs in eukaryotes. Some of the distinctive features of DNA replication in eukaryotes are that the eukaryotic chromosomes are linear as opposed to the circular bacterial E. coli chromosome that we discussed earlier. DNA replication occurs only once per cell cycle in S phase. And the initiation of DNA replication in eukaryotes is highly regulated. So helicase loading and activation are temporarily segregated in different phases of the cell cycle. As was explained in detail in lecture nine, uh, origin licensing by loading of helicase occurs in the G1 phase, while helicase activation to initiate DNA replication occurs in S phase. We uh, have mentioned that eukaryotic chromosomes have multiple origins of replication. And the origins, these multiple origins, they do not fire simultaneously. Some of them fire early while others fire late in the S phase. Therefore, different parts of the same chromosome may replicate at different times in S phase. There's a large multi subunit complex termed ORC, the origin recognition complex, that binds to origins at all times in the cell cycle in eukaryotes. Chromosomal DNA is bound to nucleosomes, and along with DNA replication, new nucleosomes have to be assembled behind the replication fork. The chromosome ends of these linear chromosomes have protective structures. They have repetitive sequences and are associated with the enzyme telomerase that replicates the ends of chromosomes. In yeast also, the replication originates at specific sites termed origins or arses, that is autonomously replicating sequences. Uh, these origins in budding yeast, they were first identified by the ability to confer stable replication to episomes. And for this reason, they were referred to as autonomously replicating sequences or arses. So in this type of experiment, different DNA fragments from yeast were cloned into a plasmid or an episome, uh, which was having a selectable uh, marker, HIS3, which is an oxytrophic marker. So there was a collection of such uh, DNA um, plas plasmids uh, having these DNA fragments from yeast. And uh, they were transfected into HIS3 oxytroph yeast strains and then plated on histidine omission selective plates to select for this uh, marker HIS3 on the plasmid. And uh, they looked for colony formation and it was found that the vector alone, that is without any insert or inserts which uh, did not have origin like activity formed very few colonies. Whereas there were certain DNA fragments that when they were inserted, there was a high frequency of transformants. And then when these uh, colonies were analyzed, it was found that in this case where you got high, uh, you got rare transformants, uh, they did have the His marker, of course, but the DNA uh, had been integrated in the chromosome, whereas in this case, they were autonomously replicating. That is, they had replicating plasmid DNA. The DNA which uh, entered these cells was able to replicate on its own. And then uh, the insert sequences were analyzed and they were found to have these sequences which have the capability of transferring the ability to replicate onto a plasmid. So uh, in fact, later on, these sequences were also characterized uh, in the context of the genome. And it was found, in fact, 
that uh, DNA replication indeed originates at these sequences. Uh, the yeast R's element, it has got a conserved 11 base pair, R's consensus sequence or ACS. And it's got three additional elements, B1, B2 and B3. B3 is not mentioned here or shown here. And uh, these are important for origin activity. ORC binds uh, these elements, ACS and B1. Uh, and then it recruits some additional proteins such as the MCM helicase to the origin and uh, that binds at B2 and other factors bind at B3. Uh, the R's elements are uh, AT rich and of course as you know this makes sense because AT base pairs have only two hydrogen bonds and therefore DNA segments which are AT rich are easier to melt. Um, which is required for initiation of DNA replication, of course. Now, this figure has been taken from a review article in Genetics by Steve Bell and Karim Labib, and also some of the additional figures in this lecture. And I would suggest you to look up uh, the article if you're interested. Some of the additional interesting points about ARCES are that some of these uh, ARCES elements were shown to act as uh, the replicators in their chromosomal locations by two-dimensional gel electrophoresis by Breuer and Fangman, who had developed that technique to actually map uh, a site of replication initiation on a chromosome. And uh, the comparison of these elements identified also an extended ACS, uh, referred to as an EACS, which was spanning uh, 19 base pairs. Uh, ORC binds this DNA in vitro and also in vivo, it leaves an in vivo footprint on this DNA, which is regulated during the cell cycle. Um, and the genome-wide studies of ORC DNA binding uh, were also done at a high resolution. And another consensus was defined, which uh, includes this extended ACS but it spans greater than 30 base pairs and this is referred to as the ORC ACS, the ORC R's consensus sequence. And uh, of course this has been analyzed functionally and mutations in this sequence, um, they are not uh, consistent with replication. So uh, mutations in this sequence would inactivate the ability of the sequence to act as a replicator. Now, uh, the chromosomes of eukaryotes have multiple origins of replication. They are linear. And initiating replication from multiple origins perhaps helps in completing the replication of the large chromosome faster. Of course, that's quite obvious because if you have only one origin, it has to tr uh, traverse a very large distance and these chromosomes are longer than those of prokaryotes in general. The replication fork has to traverse a shorter distance, only the inter-origin distance in this case when there are multiple origins. So uh, the cell can manage to still have a short S phase despite the large size of the genome. In addition, another interesting feature is that there is temporal regulation of origin firing. Some origins fire early in S phase, whereas there are others which fire late within the same S phase. Uh, some other interesting points are that the origins which fire with a similar timing, they cluster along the chromosomes and origins near the centromere are early replicating and those near telomeres are late replicating. Um, in contrast with prokaryotes, in eukaryotes, uh, the helicase loading and activation occur in different stages of the cell cycle. So uh, with this process in mind, the cell cycle can be split into two phases, okay, with respect to DNA replication. 
So helicase loading only occurs in the G1 phase when the cyclin dependent kinase levels are low and SCDK is activated by phosphorylation of CYK1, a CKI inhibitor by the G1 CDK and then it's SCIF E3 ligase mediated ubiquitylation and degradation occurs and this results in activation of the SCDK that then triggers the S phase transition. The increased levels of the S phase CDK uh, in S and also high CDK levels in G2 and M also, they prevent helicase reloading through multiple mechanisms which we have discussed in detail. So uh, the enhanced CDK levels are required to activate the assembly of the CMG, the helicase complex and the uh, helicase activation ensuring that uh, there's no helicase is activated during G1. So this regulation ensures that no origin can initiate more than once per cell cycle. Okay, so binding happens in G1, activation happens in S phase. Um, you can try to remember that that's an important aspect of regulation. So let's try to understand the steps in replication in budding yeast, starting with helicase recruitment. The helicase in budding yeast is the MCM hexamer, and this consists of six different subunits having the AAA plus ATPase domain. And uh, they are not identical. Each subunit is a different protein, and they form a ring with a hole in the middle. ORC binds at origins. We've already discussed this a few times. And this initial ORC CDC6 complex also is thought to form a ring-like complex of again AAA plus related subunits and they encircle the origin DNA. Uh, this complex may then recruit uh, one MCM uh, CDT1 complex to the adjacent DNA uh, which is shown here to form what is referred to as the OCCM complex and of course in the end there is a double hexamer of the MCM hexamer is assembled in a head-to-head -head orientation on this DNA and the mechanism for this is still unclear how it happens that two of them end up there but indeed uh, they are found to be bound there so uh, it's thought that either the MCM complex itself recruits another MCM complex or maybe uh, it could happen that another orc binds and then recruits the second MCM hexamer so the mechanism mechanism of this is not exactly clear right now Following recruitment of the helicase and origin licensing in NS phase, the activation of the helicase occurs by the SCDK and the DDK. Uh, activation involves the remodeling of this MCM complex double hexamer and the bound origin DNA. So initially this double hexamer encircles the double stranded origin uh, DNA. But the active helicase, uh, which is known as a CMG complex, has only one copy of this complex and it encircles single stranded DNA. So for this transition, there have to be a number of steps. There should be the solution of the interactions between these two hexamers and there has to be strand separation at the origin and there has to be opening of each of the MCM rings and uh, extrusion of the opposite single stranded DNA from the two MCM complexes. And then the ring has to close around the uh, single stranded DNA. And so the details of this process are not very well understood as of now. Because this is a very complex process and there are also several additional factors 
uh, which are required for helicase activation for example SLD3, SLD2 and this protein DPB11 DPB11 that are uh, required but they are not part of the final replisome. Um, here's also a model for the mechanism of the initial origin DNA melting by the MCM complex, the double hexamer. So these helicases, they translocate double-stranded DNA towards itself and they cause the melting of the AT-rich origin DNA. So in eukaryotes, interestingly, there are three multi-subunit DNA polymerases which are essential for replication and they have been studied in budding yeast in quite some detail. These are Paul Alpha, Paul Delta and Paul Epsilon. Each of them has a distinct role at the replication forks. So you can think of it as a sort of division of labor among these uh, three DNA polymerases at the fork. Only Paul Alpha can begin the new DNA chains because it's got a heterodimeric primase subunits that synthesize 8 to 10 nucleotide RNA primers. And uh, it also has a Paul 1 DNA polymerase subunit which can then extend that same primer to about 10 or 15 nucleotides. And then uh, this enzyme though it has got limited processivity and it also has uh, deficiency in proofreading so uh, it can make frequent errors and therefore it's not suitable for uh, the replication elongation steps. Uh, both Paul Epsilon and Delta are highly processive enzymes and they also have a proofreading exonuclease activity that reduces the rate of errors during the process of replication. Paul Epsilon is mainly responsible for extending the leading strand at the replication fork, whereas Paul Delta completes the synthesis of each Okazaki fragment on the lagging strand that had been started by Paul Alpha. Also in budding yeast, there are multiple sliding clamp loaders, which are referred to as RFCs, as I mentioned. So after Paul Alpha detaches from the template, following the synthesis of an RNA DNA primer, the clamp loader, uh, which has RFC1, RFC1, RFC, can effectively compete for access to the uh, three prime end. And that's shown over here. And uh, so the three prime end of the primer now ca can be bound by this RFC, which also brings along the clamp. And uh, the clamp in this case is referred to as PCNA. So ultimately uh, there is loading of PCNA around the double stranded DNA. Now this loading of the clamp leads to recruitment of Paul Delta. So now Paul Delta comes and it's attached to the clamp which then extends the new Okazaki fragment. So this is going on on the lagging strand. Another RFC, the CTF18 containing RFC, associates with Paul Epsilon and this is thought to contribute to the loading of PCNA onto the leading strand side of the fork. And uh, finally, another RFC which has uh, ELG1 or ELG1, I shall refer to it as ELG1 RFC, is also recruited to PCNA. Now this is a bit different. This recruitment is helped by sumoylation and uh, after ligation of the Okazaki fragments, this results actually in the removal of PCNA uh, from the replicated DNA. Shown here is the structure of the budding yeast replicative Paul Delta, which is complex with the primer template and the PCNA clamp. And the structure was reduced by electron microscopy. This is a 3.2 angstrom cry uh, cryo structure 
uh, deduced by Zeng et al. of the budding yeast complex. So uh, Paul Delta is in a complex with primed DNA. Uh, the template DNA primer is shown here in green color. And uh, the PCNA clamp is, uh, because it's multi subunit, is shown as this multicolor ring or disc like structure. Now, this model reported in this study uh, showed some very interesting features. Uh, for example, they found that Paul Delta uh, binds only one of the subunits of the PCNA trimer. And uh, this interaction, though, uh, it's only with one subunit, but it's extensive and it holds the DNA such that uh, the two nanometer wide DNA, it threads uh, through the center of the three nanometer channel of the clamp without making direct contact with the protein. So thus there's a water mediated clamp DNA interface, which enables the PCNA clamp to water skate as per the author's terminology uh, along the duplex with a minimum drag. So to summarize, chromosomes of eukaryotes have multiple origins and they are linear. There are three essential DNA polymerases showing division of labor. The uh, DNA pol alpha, which is important for primer synthesis, and DNA pol delta and epsilon, which are important for lagging strand and leading strand DNA synthesis. And also, uh, as the process continues, um, in the end, the primers have to be removed and there are enzymes FEN1 and DNA2. Uh, they are important for cleavage of the displaced RNA primer flap. So this is formed because Paul Delta displaces the primer as it synthesizes the DNA and uh, forms this flap-like structure and this is then cleaved by the flap-specific endonucleases. The gap which is formed by this cleavage is then later sealed by uh, the DNA ligase. In the next part of this lecture, we'll deal with some of these additional steps and also other aspects of replication in eukaryotes. And we'll also talk about the completion of DNA replication. This slide shows the generic uh, DNA elongation process uh, during replication, as has already been discussed. Uh, note the additional enzyme topoisomerase, which is shown in front of the fork. These enzymes, they help in relieving torsional stress, which is created by unwinding of the DNA double helix by the helicase enzyme at a progressing replication fork. Especially uh, when free rotation around the ends is not possible. Uh, for example, in case of long chromosomes, it becomes difficult to achieve this type of rotation and the role of these enzymes uh, becomes very important. When helicase unwinds the DNA, then torsional stress builds up. And this can actually be relieved by the rotation of the DNA ahead of the fork. However, when this can't happen, for example, in case of the long chromosomes, or here it is shown that the DNA itself is tethered to a support and therefore uh, it cannot uh, undergo that rotation then uh, when you have unwinding of the DNA uh, during DNA replication in the absence of such free rotation possible ahead of the fork to relieve the torsional stress this results in the DNA in front of the fork becoming overwound and then it can become supercoiled as is shown here these are the supercoiled regions. And uh, after a certain point, the fork progression itself uh, would be hindered when uh, there's a, a buildup of torsional stress beyond a certain level, then it cannot really progress forward. So topoisomerases are enzymes that have got 
a reversible nucleus activity and uh, they help in relieving such torsional stress. The topoisomerases, they can attach covalently uh, to a phosphate in the DNA chain backbone and uh, they can bring about strand break, they can break a phosphodiester bond. And then the bond is reformed as this uh, protein or the enzyme is released. For example, here is shown the action of uh, topoisomerase. So topoisomerase 1 can create a transient single-stranded DNA break. And then the DNA on either side of the NIC can actually uh, rotate freely around this phosphodiester bond on the opposite strand of the, the strand, the point opposite the break. The tension in the helix will drive this rotation in the direction that relieves the tension. And then after this uh, rotation, then uh, the gap is uh, rapidly resealed uh, using the energy that was released by its earlier cleavage of this bond and was stored in the top 1 DNA phosphate bond. So additional energy is not really required for this process. Another enzyme topoisomerase 2 can bind and form covalent linkage to two strands of the DNA helix that cross each other simultaneously and uh, it creates a double strand break. ATP hydrolysis is used uh, to break one DNA strand and uh, it creates a DNA gate. And now the second helix which is unbroken can pass through this gate. After this the double strand break is sealed and the topoisomerase is released and the two strands can be separated. So here is the example shown for two interlock circles but this can also occur in the supercoiled regions produced in front of the replication fork. So uh, topoisomerase 2 can relieve the tension in front of the replication fork during DNA replication. Uh, at crossovers in supercoils, the passage of these strands, they, uh, again it occurs in the direction that reduces supercoiling. Topoisomerase 2 is also important for untangling chromosomes during DNA replication to help in their proper separation later on. Here is shown a model for the removal of the RNA primer and the completion of synthesis of Okazaki fragments. When a polymerase delta reaches the 5' prime end of the preceding Okazaki fragment, then it uh, displaces a small flap. And uh, this flap is then cut by uh, an enzyme FEN1. So FEN1 it's a nucleus and uh, it can cut this flap but if there's a longer flap formed it can be cut by another enzyme DNA2. Now after this again the strand displacement uh, it goes on till the polymerase delta reaches a midpoint of a nucleosome on the preceding fragment. So now when it reaches this nucleosome, uh, Paul Delta detaches from this template and then ligation and completion of DNA synthesis can take place. In eukaryotes during DNA replication, the chromatin organization also has to be maintained. Uh, DNA unwinding by the CMG helicase displaces the parental histones. But uh, there is a tetramer of the histone H3H4 which is actually retained. 
uh, and this is possibly because uh, some of the replisome components such as MCM2 and fat, uh, they can actually bind histones. So this helps in the uh, local re-reposition of the parental H3, H4 tetramers onto the newly synthesized DNA. Uh, so uh, the reposition of the newly synthesized histone H3, H4 also occurs and uh, this is uh, helped by chaperones such as CAF1. Um, the histones H2A and H2B though they are released from the DNA during replication but these histones uh, H2A and H2B are restored by another histone chaperone NAP1 using both the old as well as the new histones. So in this way, the nucleosomes also can be regenerated on the daughter strands along with the process of DNA replication. Now the termination of replication occurs at converging replication forks. Replication forks which were initiated at a single origin, they move away from each other in opposite directions. The other one on this side is not shown here, obviously. Um, and then uh, the progression of these forks would stop when the one replication fork collides head on with another replication fork, which is moving in the opposite direction. And in fact, this is coming from an adjacent replicon. It will also stop when the replication fork reaches the chromosome end in case of linear chromosomes. Uh, the process of termination, it uh, involves the disassembly of the CMG uh, helicase. So uh, the E3 ligase, SCIF, we have discussed this earlier, the SCIF dia mediated ubiquitylation of the MCM7 subunit of the CMG helicase occurs and this prepares it for disassembly by another uh, protein uh, known as CDC48. Uh, it's referred to as a segregase and uh, actually this process is not very well understood but uh, the CMG helicase is removed and disassembled and uh, then uh, this uh, process of termination is completed. Now, um, as replication is going on, there could be replication defects. And when these defects occur, then they uh, tend to accumulate or expose longer uh, length single-stranded DNA at the replication forks. And uh, there's accumulation of the single-strand binding protein, RPA. And this structure recruits the MEC1 and DDC2. MEC1, as you know, is a checkpoint kinase to initiate the S phase checkpoint pathway. So MEC1 then goes ahead and it phosphorates its uh, numerous targets, uh, which includes the replisome component MRC1, which was um, discussed as the mediator of the replication checkpoint and it, it recruits the downstream uh, checkpoint kinase RAD53 and recruitment of RAD53 promotes its own autophosphorylation and activation. Now these two activated uh, enzymes MEC1 and RAD53 bring out a number of responses in the presence of these stalled uh, replication forks and these include uh, block to mitosis in the presence of replication defects or uh, stimulation of the ribonucleotide re reductase activity, uh, maintenance of transcription factors uh, which are expressed during S phase and uh, so these factors, they are expressed during S phase and they continue to be expressed when this pathway is activated. 
and uh, inhibition of the replication initiation factor such as SLD3 and DBF4 at replication origins. So that uh, new forks are not uh, created until the source of this original problem in replication has been uh, removed or rectified. And also they bring about the phosphorylation of histone H2A uh, so that uh, they can recruit chromatin remodeling enzymes near the replication fork. Post-translational modifications of PCNA also help in preserving genomic integrity. Uh, the sliding clamp PCNA is sumoylated on lysine uh, 164 uh, by the sumo E3 ligase cis1 along with the UBC9 sumo conjugating E2 enzyme. Sumoylated PCNA uh, recruits SRS2 translocase. Uh, this is a factor that displaces recombination factors and hence it reduces the illicit recombination events that might uh, interfere with the progression of DNA replication forks. Now, accumulation of the RPA-coated single-stranded DNA at re defective replication forks also has uh, another effect. It can recruit the E3 ubiquitin ligase RAD18. RAD18 helps in the monoubiculation of lysine 164 of PCNA by RAD6. And this leads to the recruitment of uh, translation DNA polymerases. Uh, unlike the polymerase epsilon or delta, these translation polymerases are able to incorporate DNTPs opposite damage bases also. And uh, this allows the replication machinery to bypass the damage base, which can potentially be repaired post replicatively. Alternatively, the monoubiculated PCNA can be modified by RAD5 in association with the E2 complex MMS2 UBC13, producing a K63 linked ubiquitin chain at the lysine 164 of PCNA. And this activates an error-free uh, DNA repair pathway. All right. So recall that the chromosomes of eukaryotes, they have got multiple origins and they are linear. And we also discussed that there's a temporal order of origin firing. What this means is that some origins fire early, whereas others fire late. Uh, within the same S phase. And uh, this can be useful because if a replication fork, such as the one shown here, gets blocked due to damage and then uh, it could not be repaired in a timely fashion and the replication ceases, so there is an incomplete replication here, um, it could later be rescued by a fork which is coming from a late firing origin. And this unreplicated region could be replicated later in the same S phase. And this possibility does not arise if all the origins had fired at the same time and the block was there and it could not get rectified and was left unreplicated. So this is a, a useful feature to ensure the complete uh, replication of the chromosomes even though some problems may arise at the replication forks. Now coming to the end, uh, the linear chromosomes they have an end replication problem due to incomplete replication on the lagging strand. During lagging strand replication uh, as you know, a back stitching mechanism is used uh, to form short Okazaki fragments. So this results in a problem when the fork reaches the end of the linear chromosome. Then there is no place to produce the RNA primer needed to initiate the last fragment at the end of the linear DNA molecule. 
after the removal of the last primer then this region which corresponds to the final rna primer synthesized on the lagging strand cannot be copied into dna uh, because there's no 3 prime oh available 3 uh, prime oh end available for the extension if this problem is left unresolved this end replication problem can result in loss of dna or uh, that is genetic information from the chromosome ends each time the cell divides uh, there are repetitive sequences term telomeres which are present at the ends of chromosomes in eukaryotes in the absence of a mechanism to address this end replication problem with successive divisions uh the shortening of telomeres can occur as is shown here that is the number of telomeres telomeric repeats will keep on shortening and at some point even the unique sequences may get exposed the repetitive sequences present at the ends of the chromosomes they protect the ends these repetitive sequences are uh, tandem repeats of a short sequence that is similar so in humans this sequence is ggg tta it is repeated thousands of times at each telomere so uh, the sequence is actually recognized by specific dna binding proteins that uh, recruit the enzyme telomerase telomerase binds uh, the tip of the telomere repeat sequence as shown here and it extends the 3 prime end of the parental strand using an rna template that is part of this telomerase enzyme itself in fact the enzymatic part of the telomerase enzyme is similar to reverse transcriptases uh, that is the telomerase rna also contributes functional groups to um make the catalysis process efficient so uh, now the replication of this lagging strand can be completed as a normal process using the extension as a template to synthesize the complementary strand here's the reference to a useful review article on the topic of chromosome duplication in budding yeast That's quite an interesting read. I hope this lecture has provided all of you with useful information about the process of DNA replication in eukaryotes. Thank you.